All right, we've been preaching through Ecclesiastes, and we're in now chapter 9. And I'm going to put two verses together for us. Title of my message, Sponge Boys, the agenda to make boys soft and weak. You better get a hold of what I need to say today. It says in verse 3 of chapter 9, there is an evil among all things that are done under the sun. And there is one event unto all. Yea, also the heart of the sons of men, the sons of men, is full of evil, and madness is in their heart while they live. And after that, they go to the dead. And now look at verse 10. Whatsoever thy hand findeth to do, do it with thy might. For there is no work, nor device, nor knowledge, nor wisdom in the grave whither thou goest. Dear Lord, I do pray that you help me preach this properly and that you will bless the preaching and the hearing, dear God, that we might raise up a godly seed, that this church might turn out godly young men and women, and Lord, that they'd be full of your fire, your zeal, and your strength. In Jesus' holy name, amen. There's a plague, a plague that has come upon the world today, especially in our nation. Much of what I say today can apply equally to daughters. But I want to address particularly, as we've done before in the past, this issue of sons. The plague I am addressing has to do with the fact that too many boys are being raised to be soft in a sinful manner, in an unnatural manner. And this is perverting the whole fabric of society. Please don't close down or shut down your mind in regard to what I'm trying to say. The majority think this is wonderful. They think this is their sought-after golden age that they've been looking for. The Bible calls their golden, golden age the age of Aquarius. Now, not the age of Aquarius. That's what the astrologers and cultists call it. The Bible calls it the falling away. The falling away. That's what God thinks about it. It's a falling away from the old past, the traditional roles. And the Bible says those old paths bring rest to your souls. But a generation will come that will reject the old ways. And God says they will not find rest. They will find cursing. Let me give you an example. Here's Thomas Haller in his book, Dissolving Toxic Masculinity. He says a cata Clismic shift in our culture has been brewing for decades. An unimaginable alteration in the fabric of society has finally occurred. He thinks it's a good thing. Listen to what he's saying. He says this is amazing. It is, it is cataclysmic. Now, he does not use these words, but you can go back to the late 60s. And you can hear the song, I wouldn't suggest you do, but it was a hit song at the time called This is the Dawning of the Age of Aquarius. What did they mean? It meant that men were starting to be, become androgynous, that we are leaving the Pisces age of masculinity and we are entering the age of compassion and toleration where women will rule. Astrologers believe it. Occult people believe it. Marilyn Ferguson wrote a book called The Aquarian Conspiracy showing how government, Hollywood, everywhere in society is saturated with this view and they know what's going on. They believe it's a good thing. Our Bible says it's not a good thing. Holler talks about toxic masculinity and he raises up a few things like that we would all agree with. He says there's the man who comes home at night and plays video games all night, neglecting the family. There's the man that's cruel to his wife. We would all agree 
that that is not a biblical form of masculinity. But what these folks really mean is something far different than just a husband being cruel. What they mean is they want this radical transformation that redefines what it means to be a boy, what it means to finally be a man. They want that gone out of here. They don't want tough love. They don't want standards. They don't want responsibility. They don't want accountability. They want all of that out the window. The boys are being raised in the midst of this transformation of society. If you aren't awake that this is happening, you're going to suffer. You're going to suffer. You must know that this is happening. You must know that it's by design, satanic design, and even political design. You must know that this has been going on for decades. In fact, it's so bad that here's a book put out in the late 50s by the Look Magazine. Look Magazine, the editors of Look Magazine, called The Decline of the American Male by the editors of Look. And here's a fella, he's like a little puppet being controlled by the female. This isn't fundamentalism, folks. This is 1958, why do women dominate him? It says, scientists who study human behavior fear that the American male is now dominated by the American female. The scientists worry that in the years since the end of World War II, he has changed radically and dangerously. He has changed as a boy growing up. He goes on to say that, or the editors go on to say, there seems to be little question that the American male's proud reputation for being the best father in the world is in jeopardy. In too many homes, he has been pushed out of any significant role in rearing his son. For years, authorities have urged women to convert the male, the father, into a male version of the mother. That's if the father's even around. Walt Disney thinks first of the American women when planning all his movies and television programs. He explains, they, the women, are the masters of the TV set and the theater. They're the ones who drag women, uh, men along. If the women like it, the blank with the men. Okay, if you can't look out in this world today with transgenders and transvestites reading books in libraries to children. If you can't look and see something's wrong with America, you'll never wake up. You are asleep. You are drunk with the spirit of this world. It is way past time to wake up. Listen to me, young man. I have a different vision for you. God has a different vision for you. And God wants you to be strong where you should be strong. God wants you to be able to, to, to be a spiritual warrior, to be able to defend your family, to be responsible. To, to be self-reliant, to be able to get a job done. But I'm going to tell you something, boys. Many of you today are being raised to be sponge boys. Sponge boys. Nerf boys. You boys ever played with Nerf basketballs? You ever played with Nerf you know what Nerf is? They're afraid to say, I didn't touch no Nerf. No, it's okay to play with Nerf ball. I just don't want you to be a Nerf head, okay? Well, they're very convicted already. I didn't touch it, Pastor. I really didn't. No, no, listen. Nerf, sponges. These are sponges. Nice little pink sponges. This is what Satan wants you to be. You understand that? Sponges, hold it. Here, grab your sponges, everybody. Throw, throw some back there to the two. There you go. Uh oh, uh oh, sponges coming everywhere. Watch out. Sponges, sponges. Now be careful. She's making sure she doesn't get hit. Everybody's running. Now listen. What is it? Give me one of those sponges. If you are a sponge to God, that's a good thing. Amen? If you're a sponge to God where you just soak up that Bible, when you get around good people and elderly people and you just try to digest everything you can, that's good. But I'm going to tell you, what's happening with these new little pink sponges that are being raised all across America is these pink sponges are soaking up anything the world tells them, anything the devil puts on their mind. 
Anything their flesh wants to do, they're little pink sponges. That's what they are. And I'm going to tell you, when you try to depend upon them, look at it. What is it about a sponge? It's pliable, isn't it? It bends. This is how they are. They're tossed to and fro with every wind of doctrine. Whatever the devil wants them to do, they have no standards. They have no ability to sustain and be stable. This is how they are being raised. This is what they have become. They are sponges, sponges, sponges. Now, we have digressed from a strong nation of farm boys to become a weak nation of foam boys. Spongy foam boys. From the 1960s and 70s, what they called the dawning of the age of Aquarius, there arose androgynous rock pop stars. It led up to David Bowie and his androgynous self, to the Bee Gees. 1978, you had the Bee Gees and Andy Gibb, who died of cocaine a few years later. Soft men singing like girls, wearing long hair and silk shirts. Now, what was there in the middle of what was about to be the AIDS crisis. It has become an avalanche to where now you have little five-year-old boys coming home and saying, Mom, I want to be a girl. Where are they getting that from? Where are they getting that from? They're getting it from public school. They're getting it from TV. They're getting it from their cartoons. The enemy has used everything in their power from public school to the food supply. I... I I get tired of even having to tell you about it, but, but, but you're still asleep about it all. You have not even come close to realizing what they're doing with antibiotics, BPA, hormones, to try to manipulate your child emotionally and physically. You haven't even come close to realizing what they're doing to you. Well, one day you're going to look back, I promise, you're going to look back and you're not going to believe what has happened to America. And they're going to say, how could people have been so ignorant that this was going on? Well, I've been telling you for 20 years, over 20 years, from public school to the food supply to children's television, they are trying to remake boys and girls. 20 years ago, Christina Hoff Summers called it a war on boys. Listen to me, 20 years ago. She has a book called The War on Boys. She's no fundamental Christian. It's getting so bad that the feminists are starting to write books and says, this is ridiculous. This is an attack on boys. Folks, if you're not awake when there are feminists writing books about what's happening to boys, if you're not awake as a fundamental Christian at this point, we are now, what I was preaching about this when she began to write her book. I quoted her book way back then. If you went 20 years, two decades, and raised your child, and you went contrary, you just followed the world, shame on you, shame on you. You had 20 years. You had the warning. You could have fixed it. If you raised a sponge boy, if you raised a, a soft Nerf boy, shame on you, shame on you, if it's your fault, if it's your fault. Let's go back to 20 years ago. When she wrote The War on Boys. 1999, television had done something that it had never done before. It began to have pro-homosexual shows we're entering into primetime TV. I was way done with TV by then, so I never watched a single one of these wicked things, and God forbid would never have done so. Um, but nevertheless, they decided, let's enter into the children's cartoons and such like. So Nickelodeon, in 1999, put out SpongeBob SquarePants. 
It became so big. SpongeBob, is that what you want your boy to be, a sponge? You say, oh, this is just cute. Listen, folks, it was an agenda. It was by design. If you can't see that they wanted your kid, your boy, to grow up a little spongy boy with no backbone, shifting in the wind, pliable, soft, the opposite of what the Bible says a man should be, if you cannot see that that was by design, God help your soul. It led to feature films, awards, general applause from the whole world. The homosexual community was elated. They began to buy SpongeBob uh, keychains, everything. They wanted SpongeBob hanging from their, uh, their, their rearview mirror. Uh, everything was SpongeBob. The homosexuals were applauding. They were rejoicing. They were so happy it generated 13, over $13 billion for Nickelodeon. Are you really that unaware? Really, you can't sit down and watch something like that before you give to your child and not realize what they're doing to your children. With a preacher hollering every week about things like this. I wonder who in 1999 heard my sermon. I wonder who decided at that moment that they're going to walk out that door and right here in front of my face raise their kids under that type of environment. It's now 20 years later. I don't know who you are, but I would suspect you have a sponge for a boy. I would suspect your young adult son is a sponge, Bob, a sponge boy. Everybody knew exactly what's going on. It was a fictional place that I will not even name from the pulpit. That shows you already what type of wicked agenda this is. SpongeBob had a best friend named Patrick, a pink starfish. Why is he pink? If you're not getting the picture with pink Patrick and the little sponge boy, you need to wake up, folks. Paul said that you should not be in the dark. You should not be drunk. You ought to wake up. You shouldn't, you shouldn't be asleep like a lot of... The, the world's not even asleep about some of this. They know what's going on. They're laughing at you. They're laughing at you as a Christian. They sit here and smile and said, Oh, well, they're just sponges and starfish. They're not homosexual. They're laughing at you. They're laughing at you when you believe that type of stuff. You'll, you'll take any justification whatsoever to walk in this worldly mess. SpongeBob and Pink Patrick frequently hold hands. They like to watch TV together and sit and hold hands. You want your boy sitting and watching TV with another boy holding hands? Is that what you want? They love a show called Adventures of the Mermaid Man. Wow, that's way back then. Way before this transgender thing just invaded everywhere. You're going to let your boy sit down and watch about a little sponge and his little pink Patrick friend that he hold hands with as they watch Adventures of the Mermaid? Man, you should have took sledgehammers to the televisions back then. Somebody should have just grabbed you by the head and shook you awake back then. What in the world were you doing, Mama? A 2011 study conducted at the University of Virginia published in the journal Pediatrics suggested that when you allow preschool-aged audiences to watch the series Spongebob, they found short-term disruptions in mental function and attention span and neurological brain problems. What in the world did they stick in that show to mess up? And you know what? The, the show responded with, uh, 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 the creators of the show said, uh, well, we never said it was for little children like that. <laughs> they didn't even deny what it was doing to them. But th this, th that whole thing's a whole different subject. What it's doing to your brain when you watch that, that's a totally different subject for today. But it's associated. It's associated. But I'm talking about this is overt stuff. If you're still not convinced, Pink Patrick wants to be a mom. He and SpongeBob adopt a little child clown. And he says, I want to be the mom and you could be the dad. 
But he ends up being the daddy in the end, so he puts on a suit and tie while SpongeBob puts on a colorful dress. Homosexuals loved it. Way back then, homosexuals were jumping with joy. Where's God's church? Where's God's light of the world? It's hid under a bushel, under a bed. They're, they're going home, driving home, mocking the preacher. You got men driving home thinking, I think we ought to get this trash out of our house. And, and they're being berated. Oh, you just think you're a pastor clone. Why don't you be a man? Why don't you think for yourself? There's nothing wrong with this. What is he going to find out his bad neck? And you just rail on him and rail on him. And even Samson couldn't put up with that railing every single day and that constant, constant uh, pressure and manipulation. And, uh, and I'm not saying these men should have caved in, but I'm telling you, you've got a generation. This is what's going on around the country. This is what's been going on for the past 20 years. And I wonder when you're going to wake up. Boy, do we got children today. Boy, do we got young boys. Boy, do we got teenagers today that are sponge boys. Sponge boys. You're soft. You're a sponge. Transgender characters have been invading video games as well. You think they're going to sit back with this great agenda, uh, th th this wicked agenda, this powerful agenda? This, you think they're going to leave your video games alone? Uh, put aside for a second what it's doing to your child to just sit here and never get any work, never get anything that toughens him up. Just as he sits there like, like a little sponge, a little effeminate sponge, playing video games all day. No work, no manliness, nothing uh, uh, to conquer uh, other than a little thing on the, uh, on the video game. But, but nevertheless, they're not going to sit back and allow that. So they invaded the video game agenda and they started bringing in all of these transvestite characters, LGBT characters, so-called. You can go to Wikipedia right now, list of video games with LGBT characters. I'm not going to get in at all, but, but they want you to role play. Oh, what a wonderful time. You want to role play and be a girl? Oh, this will be a great little game. You can role play and you can be the girl. Or not only, and then you find out later, oh, it wasn't really a girl. It was a transvestite the whole time. And, uh, you know, this is, they tell you this. They tell you this. What we see in this is a shunning, a despising of the true God-ordained glory of young men. What is the glory that young men are to grow and mature into? Look at Proverbs 20. The glory of young men is their long, beautiful, feminine hair. The glory of young men is their softness and toleration and cooperation. The glory of young men is that they like quilting. The glory of young men Young man is being a plain man like Jacob, always staying inside the tent in the kitchen with his mama. Hey, you better listen to me. Jacob wanted his birthright, and he wanted his brother's birthright, but he wanted it in the wrong way, and he was manipulated by his mama because he was a mama's boy. And I'm going to tell you, you see what God did to Jacob? He went through the school of hard knocks to toughen up. And when he finally got tough, he came back out of it and says, you're going to change your garments. Anybody in my house, you're going to get rid of these idols. You're going to change your garments. We're going up to Bethel, the house of God. He was a new man. He was a new man. He wasn't a sissy boy anymore. But he was manipulated by his mama, and he paid for it. He paid for it. Mamas, just because you can manipulate your boy to turn against daddy, understand the boy is going to pay for it. You're not going to be able to pay for his... Uh, his school of hard knocks. You're not going to be able to graduate that school for him. He's going to have a hard time. Esau was a man of the field. He knew how to go out and hunt and get things done. It's, got, it's not God's ideal that you just carry around a shotgun inside your truck and, and you don't have any type of concern for God. You just go work and hunt and you don't think about God. No, David wasn't like that. David was a warrior. David was a godly man, but he could write psalms to God. He could sing and he had a spiritual side to him. And that's what you need. It's not, it's not feminine to have a spiritual side. You understand that. But God doesn't want you to be... 
Many of you are raising Jacobs without any spirit. You're just raising a bunch of video game plain men, plain boys in the tent, mama's boys, and they don't even have the spirituality that Jacob had. Look at Ephesians 4. It said the Lord Jesus gave some apostles and some prophets and some evangelists and some pastors and teachers. What are these pastors and teachers given to the church for? Verse 12, for the perfecting of the saints. Now you better read that. Folks out there better read this. God says the church is a pillar and ground of the truth and he gave you a pastor for your perfection. For your perfection. That's what it says. That's what he says. So what's the problem? The problem is, of course, many pastors are not walking in the role. Uh, they're full of worldliness in Hollywood and they're not perfecting the saints with the word of God. But there's a bigger problem. Or, or, or shall I say another problem? Till we all come unto a perfect man. That's the goal, to go up into maturity, that your men be men. And, but what does it say? That we henceforth be no more children, tossed to and fro, and carried about with every wind of doctrine. Now what happens, folks? What happens when a generation grows up under SpongeBob, and they grow up to be little sponge boys, and by the time they're in their 20s, they're spongy young men with no strength, no backbone. What happens? They go to church. They hear a God called pastor and they get their feelings hurt. They can't stay in church. They're not used to anybody charging them. The Bible says fathers charge their children. Paul says, I charge you like a father does. They've never had fathers say, son, get up. Son, wake up out of bed. Son, get that job done. Son, quit whining. Let's get moving, boy. Come on, let's, let's go. Get moving. We got to get this done, son. Let's go. So don't you, don't, you fr don't you pout with me, boy. Get that look off your face. Quit being a sissy. Now get up and let's get this job done, boy. They haven't grown up with that. They have not grown up with that. If they've even been around their dads. So they, they come into church and they're handicapped. They won't endure sound doctrine. They said, I'm not listening to that pastor. He's mean. He's talking about mean things. He, he bothers my spirit. Everything's negative. So what, what happens? They're too proud to hear a pastor and grow up to maturity. They're too whiny, too childish, too sensitive, too distracted, too lazy, too unable to receive instruction. I preached at him for years and had him get up and walk outside after 10 minutes of preaching. I go and chase him down after church, say, son, come here. What, what, what's wrong with you, man? How come you can't sit in a sermon and sit still and listen to somebody preach at you, man? He said, I, I don't know. It's like pressure. It bothers me. It ought to be pressure, man. I'm trying to get you to do something. I'm trying to get you to realize the war you're in. This is a war. You're not at recess playing kickball, boy. This is a war. This is a spiritual battle. There's a real devil. A real hell. So what happens is these little sponge boys, they fall prey. Hey, I'm going to leave that church when I'm 18. I can't. I'm going to leave that church. Well, you leave it, you little, you little sponge, and here's what's going to happen to you. You're going to get out here, and you're going to soak up whatever the world tells you in five minutes. Peer, you say, no, no, I'll be strong. No, peer pressure, they'll have you in five minutes. They'll tell you what to believe. They'll make a little communist out of you, a little effeminate pro-homosexual communist. You'll be a little pro-homosexual, effeminate, unbelieving communist in five minutes because you have no backbone. You're going to be tossed to and fro by the devil. Paul says there's false teachers out there who will promise you liberty. Come on, boys. I want to see your face. Don't hide your face from me, boys. I'm trying to preach today. Listen to what Paul says. This is what Peter says. 2 Peter 2, beguiling unstable souls. Y'all awake? Begui I tell you what, if you're asleep during this sermon, you are a sponge boy. I tell you what. The Bible says, beguiling unstable souls. That's what false teachers are going to do. 
What souls do they go after, brother? Unstable. Unstable. They go after the sponge boys. Beguiling, unstable souls. How do they do it? They promise them liberty. Promise them liberty. So if you leave your home as a boy at 18, 19, whatever years old, and you are unstable, you've never got any backbone, you've never learned to stand up against peer pressure and against the devil and against the world, and you haven't been trained as a warrior, buddy, there's people coming after you. There's spirits coming after you. And here's what happens. It says in James, a double-minded man's unstable in all his ways. You're going to be up and down, up and down, tossed to and fro and everything, but never able to settle down, never able to take care of yourself, and never able to take care of anybody and be of a benefit to anybody, really. The Bible says there are clouds without water, blown about, says Jude. What are these, when these Nerf boys get older, you're not going to be able to depend upon them. If there's trouble or a great need or a great battle, they won't be there beside your side to take care of, to, to help you, to, to help lift you up, to help lift your hands up. They're not going to be there. They're Nerf boys. You ever tried to lean on a sponge? Buddy, you can't lean on a sponge. It says in Isaiah 3, Lo, thou trusteth in the staff of this broken reed of Egypt, wherein if a man lead, uh, lean, it'll go into his hand and pierce it. You can't grab it. It looks like a good stick. It looks like a good rod. But then you go to lean on it, and it cranks. It, it breaks real quick. You ever seen that? I've seen reeds like that. They're pretty good to walk around with, and you think you got something to lean on, and then I tell you what, it'll, it'll poke you. It'll break right when you're trying to trust in it. You don't want boys around you like that. You don't want to raise young boys and teenagers to become like that. You want them to grow up that somebody can depend upon. They can rely upon them. If everybody else is going to hell and following the devil, they're going to stand up and be an Enoch and be a Noah and say, not me, not right now. I'm going to be a Josiah. We're going against the whole thing. We're going to tear down the houses of the Sodomites. Uh, we're, we're not following this thing. You need boys with backbone that will stand up. Amen. It says, Proverbs 25, confidence in an unfaithful man in time of trouble is like a broken tooth and a foot out of joint. Sponge boys, you can't trust them. You can't trust them. You might need them one day. You, you might help them and help them and help them, and one day you fall in a ditch. Or maybe you're going through a hard time, and you say, Son, I need you. I need you to focus right now, man. I need you. I'm under attack. I've been shot. I, I've been wounded. Something's going. My family's been wounded. I need you. I need some men to help. Sponge boys aren't going to be there, brother. Sponge boys aren't going to be there. They're going to be part of the attack. They're going to be part of the attack. Hey, pastor's down. Let's kick him. Brother so-and-so's down. Let's kick him. And you'll be a little sponge boy, a little sponge boy gnashing on him with your teeth. The Bible says in Proverbs 26, He that sends a message by the hand of a fool cutteth off the feet and drinketh damage. They'll always have an excuse. For at heart, sp sponge boys have been raised to be drama queens. I can't take it. I can't take it. They're going to blow up and get all dramatic and just whine and whine and whine and get emotional because you're an emotional drama queen, drama queen sponge boy. And, and mamas, this is what you're raising. You're raising a little dramatic drama queen. And, and you come to their defense. Daddy says, ah, oh, boy, get out here and get that job. And then he comes back with some whining excuse. And guess what? Mama gets in the way sometime. Not all mamas. Some mamas are like Deborah's. But some mom is getting away and, and, and tell the daddy, you leave him alone. He, he, he's had a hard day, you know, and, and they pamper their little drama queen. And mama, you're going to raise a drama queen. And that's what he's going to be like with his boss at work. That's what he's going to be like with his business. That's what he's going to be like all his life. Everything he's got to run from drama and run from his little problems that he keeps having. There's a lion in the street and he's going to be slain. It's too cold to plow. There's always a reason why. And he's wiser than seven men who can render a reason. The Bible said this madness is in their heart. The Bible said this wickedness is in their heart. Solomon says the heart of the sons of men is full of evil and madness. But Solomon says, don't worry, I'll show you how to take care of it. You take care of it in the Bible by the new birth, but you also take care of it by training and by chastisement. It says in Proverbs 22, foolishness is bound in the heart of a child, but the rod of correction shall drive it far from him. Listen to what Solomon says, church of God. Isn't that beautiful? Uh, it's not exactly beautiful. It's beautiful to know that it works. Amen. The Bible says that this is bound in the heart of a child. There is madness in there. There is foolishness. There is wickedness. But the rod of correction will drive it far from him. It's stuck in there. It's not coming out unless you pound it out. That's what God's saying. 
I don't mean some type of sinful abuse of a child. But, oh, we have gone so far today. Oh, my. I tell you what. Just being around, we have grandpa in our home now, and uh, j j just being reminded of the former generation. And, and it's not just that he's German and getting old, it's that whole generation, a lot of them, uh, they just, they were so much less soft w with folks. You know, that whole generation was raised in a different way. You can see it in the television shows at the time. I'm not talking about Brady Bunch with a homosexual father. I'm talking about, you know, some of the older shows where, uh, you could see, and, I, and don't go out and watch TV, I'm not endorsing television. I'm just telling you there's been a change in society. I remember a single mom came to church one time and she had some boys and I got out here and you can find out a lot about a boy and how he's raised when you get out here and work with him on church property, you know. And, and I was working with one of them and he began to wimp out on me and be a little weasel. And, and you know, I, I decided, uh -uh, I'm not putting up with it, man. And, and so I began to be a little hard with him, a little firm with him. And he said, I'll call my mama. And he called his mama and he got on the phone with her and she says, well, he's not used to this kind of stuff. I, I said, listen, ma'am, you're going to raise a homosexual and your boy is going to be a homosexual unless you quit getting in the way and delivering him and rescuing him. Some mamas, they got to rescue their child from every little trouble. They can't even solve their own problems in church or, 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 or wherever they're at. Mama's got to come in there. They're the types of mamas that'll tell the coach, you know what I mean? Why is my boy sitting down? Uh, why isn't he in the game? And then they're always going to be the, 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 the big mama's going to come protect your boy. And the boys did become a homosexual. You listen to me. They left our church and became homosexual. You better listen to what I'm telling you today. There was a time when just about everybody in a family worked somehow or another. Even the little ones, if they couldn't do anything but carry water, they carried water. Everybody in the family worked. There was time for play, but everybody had a job to do. Everybody worked. Our forefathers wouldn't understand today what's going on in the homes of America. You, you've got daughters that have never prepared meals for the family, that they're not even prepared to run a household. What in the world are you doing? What did you think they're here for? To, to be your little pets? No, you're to train these women, train these young girls, train them to run a house. They ought to be managers of a home. Mamas ought to be sitting back thinking, that's good, that's good. You ran the whole home this week. That's wonderful. Your boys ought to be able to run a home. They ought to be able to run a farm. They ought to be able to work. You ought to be training these boys to do what's right and run a home. But today there's no chastisement, there's no work, there's no responsibility, no accountability, and the boys are being left to themselves. Can I get you another ice cream? Do you need anything else? And they just sit there and grunt as they play their video game, you know? Oh, soft boy. And, and these are the boys that will look at you and curse you to your face. They'll smart off to you if you try to get them to do something. Woo, buddy. The Bible doesn't teach that homeschooling is made up of merely the three R's. You need the three R's, reading, writing, and arithmetic. But if you think that's all you need to raise your kid, you're just, God help you. God help you. Uh, the, the, the Bible says you need the other R. And that is the rod and reproof. How about these R's? Proverbs 29, the rod and reproof give wisdom. Some families are big on reproof. They got the griping and the scolding, but they're very weak on what God says ought to come before the reproof. In other words, you ought to whip them, then reprove them. Say, now, you knew not to do that, right? Now, let's talk about it. See, reproofing comes after the whipping. That's what the Bible says. And some people, they never have this. They never have this. You, you, your children don't have that R. You're not being raised with reproof, uh, with, with the rod and reproof. There's another R in working. Why are your children? I, I tell you what, I'm all for Higher math. Uh, my children have been able to read at a college level uh, at a very, very young age. I, I'm for reading. You better believe it. Get them to read and write that King James Bible. But I tell you what, a lot of that mess, a lot of that social study and science stuff and everything, uh, by, by all means, inform your children. But I tell you what, if you can't teach your child how to work, God help you. If you don't have a man by the time he's 20, God help you. If you haven't raised a man that knows how to work, God help you. Because he wasn't homeschooled. He wasn't homeschooled. It's a terrible thing what's happening to these boys. A terrible thing. I've had a busy schedule. We took a family day, went down to the river every single week. It's something that you need to do. Get them outside. Get them working with you. In my busy schedule, uh, 
I tell you what, I, I still got out and worked on the property and still do with my, with my children, with my boy. It's very, very important that you do that. I'm going to remind you again. Young boys, you listen to me, please. Listen to me. At eight years old, I worked summers with my father. I was left home. And I could either stay home and just go around the house, play with my dog all summer at eight, or my dad would get up in the morning and say, boy, you going with me or are you going to be a sissy? Now, how, can you, how can you not answer that right? You know what I mean? I'm going with you, dad, even though I didn't want to because I knew I wouldn't come home until eight o'clock that night. And I knew what we were getting into. I'm going to be craw crawling under a house, upside down, about that big. And I'm going to be nailing and stapling, stapling insulation. And that's what I did. That's what I did as a little boy. And uh, it toughened me up. I was glad to do that. He remodeled houses. Every Saturday, from the time I can remember as a boy, I had a job. I went to Miss Gregory's. I did her front yard, her backyard. I mowed, I raked it, I bagged leaves for $4.50. At 13, my summers were spent seven days a week as a camp counselor. I didn't even come home on Sunday. I, I, I was a lifeguard. Uh, I ran a, an equestrian camp at 13 years old. My winters, after school, I cleaned cages at a pet store. I cleaned rat poo. I cleaned duck poo. I cleaned dog poo. I cleaned every, I, if the, whatever animal was in there, I cleaned its cage. That's what I did. I came home from school, and I did that till 9 o'clock at night, every single day. That's what I did. At 16, we moved to Texas. I got a job playing guitar at Six Flags for $4.50 an hour. So I'm, I'm moving up now, you know. So this is good. From there, I got a job teaching uh, guitar. I had 60 students a week. I never stopped teaching guitar. By the time I was of age, I was able to move out after I graduated and support myself teaching guitar. Uh, I got a job nailing shingles during the day. I taught guitar till 9 o'clock at night, and that's what I've done. And I've never not had a job ever since then. Uh, not perfect, not perfect. A lot of things I wish would have been done different, but I'm telling you, somehow or another, somehow, I don't know how, I got a work ethic. I got a work ethic. And somehow or another, you need to give your, your child this. Somehow or another, you need to instill this in your child. I know today we've got protection issues we've got to be careful about. You've got the danger of bad exposure and sinful associations, but you need, you, you need to get down and roll up your sleeves and think about what you're going to do. But because, li listen, you might not want them to become worldly, and I agree with you. You might not want them around a bunch of atheists and think, I understand that there's a sense in which you need to protect them until they're ready. There's a monitoring and a control and a managing. But at the same time, what good is it to have a sissy, a little sponge, in his room playing a video game? You think you're raising your boy. God forbid. How about family businesses? Hey, man, what a, what a wonderful way to solve things. How about family farms? If nothing else, raise some food. If nothing else, praise God for your computer job. Praise God for your whatever your job is as a man. Praise God for it. I praise God for it. But I tell you, why, why ain't your boy doing something? Why isn't he making money? Why isn't he raising his own food? Why doesn't he have a business? What in the world's going on with your son? How old is he? Some of them don't even have chores to do, hardly. Nothing that'll make them sweat. Nothing you should give them an allowance for, that's for sure. Boys need to learn a trade, but more important than that, they need to learn to sweat. They need to learn to endure. They need to learn how to work. They need to learn how to not be sissies. They need to learn how to be tough. Not something they did one time. But over the long haul, so it becomes part of their character. Let me run through some scripture for you. I'm going to show you this is Bible. This is Bible. Look at Genesis 37. Joseph, being 47 years old, was feeding the flock. Anybody still awake? 17. Joseph, being 17 years old, was feeding the flock with his brethren. And Joseph brought, what does it say he's sitting around doing video games? No, he was working, 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 working to make money for the family. Amen. 17. And Joseph brought into his father their evil report. He's a godly boy. A godly boy. He had backbone. God's going to make him pretty much the king of the world. 
If you can't be trusted at home, son, you'll never be trusted for anything. Genesis 29, And while he yet spake with them, Rachel came with her father's sheep, for she kept them. Uh-oh. Now you have a young woman. Must have been 20, 21. I don't know how old she was, but here she is keeping sheep. She had work to do. She didn't just sit around on Facebook or social media all day. And I know there's valuable things that you could do online. But, but I'm telling you, she had a job. She worked. She's working with sheep. We got idle young ladies and idle young men, don't we? Isn't that sad? No wonder, they, no wonder they're depressed and anxious and drama queens. Exodus 2, now the priest of Midian had seven daughters, and they came and drew water and filled the troughs to water their father's flock. I don't know, with seven daughters, I don't think they were all over 20, likely. So some of these are likely teenage daughters that are out working, 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 working. Is your teenage daughter working? 1 Samuel 9, and as they went up the hill to the city, they found young maidens going out to draw water. I imagine that was pretty hard work. Pretty hard work. It's hot. It's heavy. 1 Samuel 16, Samuel said unto Jesse, Are here all thy children? And he said, There remaineth the youngest. And behold, he keepeth the sheep. So now we got Joseph and we got David. What were they doing as lads? What were they doing as teens? They were keeping sheep. They were working. Amen. They were working. And what does God say? Psalm 78, he chose David, also his servant, and took him from the sheep folds. God said, I'm going to take from watching after sheep to being a pastor of a nation. Just like Joseph. Just like Joseph. 1 Samuel 17, David said unto Saul, Thy servant kept his father's sheep, and there came a lion and a bear and took a lamb out of the flock. What am I trying to tell you, parents? Listen to me today. I'm trying to tell you that David learned how to be a fighter by being a worker in his father's house. David learned how to kill Goliath because he learned how to deal with hard times and be tough. How did he learn how to be tough? He learned it by working for his father. He said, the same God that let me kill a bear, the same God that, that helped me kill a lion, I'll kill Goliath. Praise God for that. What, what type of boy are you raising? I tell you, if your boy's not working and having any type of trials and anything to sweat and anything to accomplish, anything to overcome, anything to smash his finger, anything to get out here and cut him and thorn, if, if your boy's not being raised with work, he's not learning to become a man. The Bible said, by the sweat of thy brow shall thou eat, sweat of thy face. Even the pagans knew this. Jeremiah 7, the children gather wood and the fathers kindle the fire. And the women need their dough to make cakes to the queen of heaven. I don't want you making cakes to the queen of heaven, God forbid. But I'm going to tell you, this showed it even then. E e even the wicked families of Baal expected their, fam their, their kids to work. Wow. The royal path of life in 1879 says the greatest curse that can befall a young man is to lean while character is forming on others for support. He who begins with crutches will generally end with crutches. People who have been bolstered up all their lives are seldom good for anything in a crisis. Once down, they are as helpless as capsized turtles. If a boy is not trained to endure and bear trouble, he'll grow up a girl. And a boy that's a girl has all the girl's weaknesses without any of her regal qualities. The royal path of life says again, there is dignity in toil. In toil of the hand as well as toil of the head. There is nothing really mean and lo, but sin. You cannot dream yourself into a godly character. You must hammer and forge yourself into one. To love and to labor is the sum of living. So agrees Solomon. They go on to say, never be idle. If your hands cannot be usefully employed, attend to the cultivation of your mind. An honest, industrious boy is always wanted. He will be sought for. His services will be in demand. He will be respected and loved. I ought to be able to come up to you and say, son, what'd you do this week? You ought to be able to say, oh, I read the whole book of so-and-so in the Bible, and, and, and I wrote down and copied some notes out of it. I, I read a godly book uh, 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 this thick. You know, I, I, I learned about home building, and I read this manual. And not only that, that was just for my mind. I went out and did this, and I did this, and I did this, and I accomplished this. You ought to have something you're doing. Young lady, you ought to have something you're accomplishing every single week for your mind and for your body and for others and for God. There is even a training that is found by playing outside. If you get your children outside, it'd at least be something. Boys are too soft to be outside today. 
They walk around for a little while and they don't know what to do and they want to go back in. Were you like that? My generation wasn't like that. We wanted to get, I tell you, if it was pouring down rain and I tell you, we were miserable. We were inside. I remember that's the one time somebody brought over a little video game, you know, and we sat there and did that for a few minutes and then we got bored. We want to be playing football. We want to be exploring. We want to be out with our dogs somewhere. We want to be hiking. We want to be doing something, riding our bikes, riding dirt bikes, do so. We want to be outside. Boy, not this generation, not this generation of sponge boys. I've shown before in the coming millennium that you're praying for, you need to ask, why will children be playing outside? If there's not something right and healthy about it, why does God put it before you as a beautiful ideal? Why aren't they inside playing some wild millennial computer game? Why didn't the Bible say, and the sucking child shall play on the heavenly iPad? Why doesn't it say that? It doesn't. It says, you want to see something real beautiful? You want to be some, something real beautiful? You're going to look out and you'll see a little sucking child playing on the hole of the asp. And the weaned child shall put his hand on the cockatrice's den. They're going to be playing with poison snakes. Poison snakes. Now, God doesn't want your children out here playing with poison snakes. And you need to teach them. And you need to watch them. And you need to be wise. And you need to teach your children to be wise. We've got creeks and we've got water moccasins. We've got things. But I'm telling you what, you've got to get your child outside playing. The ideal is still there. The Bible doesn't say, so leave your child inside and never let him go outside. No, you've got to watch them. But you need to uh, get them outside playing. That is a Bible ideal for which we pray thy kingdom come when children will be outside. That's what you're praying for, man. Zechariah 8, the streets of the city shall be full of boys and girls playing in the streets thereof. There's something beautiful about kids outside playing. There's something beautiful. God said, that's what the millennium is going to be like. A bunch of natural nations created that you get to reign over if you're worthy and you get to see these kids outside playing. Why aren't they inside? Why aren't they inside? Why didn't God present that as the ideal? Because that's not the ideal. When your kids uh, get them to do their chores and then get them to get their behinds outside and get some sunshine and get out here and get some athletic and some things, some rough playing, and get them out here playing. Praise God. I love these little boys knocking on my door and coming and playing and getting my boy. I, I tell you what, I want them outside, and I want them playing. I want to hear them loud outside. I want them building things and working and wrestling, and, and that's my ideal, and I believe that's God's ideal. And uh, I don't mean just all play and no work. Get them working, but hey, guess what? It plays over. I, I mean, work's over. Go have fun. Childmind.org says why kids need to spend time in nature. They may prefer to stick to their screens, but here's why getting outdoors matters. The average American child is said to, send, is said to spend four to seven minutes a day in unstructured play outdoors and over seven hours a day in front of a screen. That's the America you're with today. That's the sponge boys you're growing up with today, kids. And uh, this is sad. I hope you're not one of them. I hope you're not one of them. PNAS says residential green space in childhood is associated with lower risk of psychiatric disorders from adolescence into adulthood. Even NPR says greener childhood associated with happier adulthood. Smaller studies have hinted that lack of green space increases the risk of mood disorders and schizophrenia and can even affect cognitive development. So you end up with a very dull, foolish child he knows all about video games and being inside, but he's a whiny boy, an emotional boy, and pretty soon he has to be on anxiety medication. You know, God help us. Here's another headline, study. Now, when I say he has to be on an anxiety medication, I believe that's all demonic. So when I, I, I used has, uh, uh, in, in, in not in an absolute way here. I mean, that's what they're going to say. That's what they're going to say. Here's a study. Horseback riding helps kids with autism and ADHD. Something about the horse. God loves horses. God rides horses. There's something about it that teaches a child important things about life. Uh, here's childinthecity.org. A recent UK study commissioned by the National Trust Fund found that children spend half the time playing outside that, than their parents did. Wow. And now we've got more children being raised without fathers at all or limited contact with their fathers. The Bible says that fathers chastise. The Bible, said that, uh, the Bible says that fathers exhort, they comfort, they give strength to, they give boldness to, and they charge you, says Paul. I charged you as a father. What does it mean? It means fathers challenge you out of your little safety zone. Fathers bring you out of that. That's what they should be. And, and, and Father, if you're in your home 
and nobody's got your hands bound and you've got full control over your children like you ought to have under God and you're not walking in that liberty, if you're not walking in that blessing that God's given you, if you're not walking in that calling to where you're teaching your child, you're charging them out of that safety zone. You're challenging them to excel, excel. There's people that give testimony from comedians to business owners. They all say, I didn't have coddling parents. They all they talk about, I was never good enough for my, for, for my, for my family. And they're not, they're not giving you a little poor me story. They're saying, that's how I became what I am. They're always telling me, well, you could do better. You could do better. And I'm not telling you to be mean to your children, but I'm just telling you that they need encouragement. They need affection. They need love. But there's a tough love that's always saying, okay, let's go. Let's do better. Let's perfect it. Uh, and, and let's get going. And that's what fathers do. That's what fathers do. And mamas ought to do it too. But this single mom thing today, where single moms are being celebrated. If you're a widow, by all means, God bless you and take care of you. If you had a sinful husband who left and abandoned his family and cheated, by all means, reach out to these single moms and help them. But other than that, why are, you, why are churches now all around America celebrating single moms without any distinction whatsoever? Uh, basically, just go leave your husband and, and we'll go celebrate your act of sin and Jezebelian character. God forbid, God forbid. I'm telling you what's happening today is it's hurting boys. It's hurting boys. The biggest problem, the main problem is you're not training your boy to endure hardness. They're not being raised to be warriors. They're being raised to be social justice warriors, whining and overreacting, effeminate and soft. They're not being raised to be the mighty men that can raise their children in this culture. They're not being raised with culture and to stick to it and become the strong man of the house to protect their house. We see in verse 10 of our text today, they haven't been trained to work with all their might. That's the ideal that God has for everybody, to work with all your might. Before mankind fell, Adam had to keep the garden. He was already a keeper of the garden. You need to work so you can be self-reliant in a godly way, support a family, help others, and support God's church. Amen. Praise God for men that have been raised to work. And I don't take it lightly. I don't take it lightly what we're able to do in this church and in this ministry and what we're able to do and, and, and to keep this all going. I don't take your work lightly, nor do I undermine. If you have an office job or a computer job, uh, you, you're working like everybody else is working. You need to get out and get some sunshine, some physical exercise. But believe me, you're working. You're working. And praise God for it. Um, but these children today, they don't have a work ethic. They're not getting out and fighting the lions and bears, so to speak, so later they can fight Goliath. They're being robbed. They're like the caterpillar whose cocoon was opened, being raised handicapped. I've been around some handicapped people as guitar students. Some of the best boys I knew were handicapped. They don't want somebody opening the door for them and always coddling them. And you, you know what I mean? They, they just, if you've ever been around a handicapped person, they don't appreciate that very much. And uh, you've got to help them where you can and where you need to. But, but they want as much as possible, just like the elderly, to be independent, to do as much by themselves as they can. And your children, they, need to be, they, they don't need you walking around coddling them and everything and protecting them. They need to get out here and live life and learn how to do things and learn how to spread those wings. You got boys today being raised to be eunuchs. And in the Bible, Jezebel surround themselves with men like this, eunuchs. So some mamas want their sons to always be dependent upon them in an unhealthy, unnatural way. So they grow up to be these little sponge blobs that lie around and jiggle around, but they have no real function, no real use. No wonder they're miserable and whiny and angry. You raise a little sponge blob and see if the sponge blob don't grow up later all handicapped and says, Mama, why'd you do this to me? Why, 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 did you, why didn't you let me get out of the cocoon so I could be something? But here I am, a little wiggly sponge, no good to anybody. And they're going to detest their mother. They're going to resent their mamas. They'll be pretty boys like Absalom, temper tantrums. Absalom didn't get his way, pretty boy with his little pretty hair. And he burned down Joab's fields, you know. They just overreact. Emotional boys. The 
Let me read you a few headlines and I'm going to close. This is from Psychology Today. If you want to know how bad things are, Church of God, this is from Psychology Today. It's so bad now that the feminists and the psychologists are trying to tell Christians to wake up and take care of your boy. I'm going to tell you something. In America today, if psychologists have to tell you that you're raising a sissy, we're in trouble. We're in trouble. You are in trouble. As a fundamental Baptist, why would a psychologist have to tell you quit raising a sissy? God help you. Psychology today, we're raising a generation of wimpy kids and the kids are paying a price. We're raising a generation of emotional wimps who lack the ability to stand on their own two feet. Many people don't seem to be alarmed that adolescence has been extended by an extra decade now. We live in a world in which 30 year olds say they're adulting when they shop for their own groceries. Their parents think it's cute. That's not fundamental Baptist. That's psychology today. Don't you accuse me. Well, he's just so mean. Oh, no, no. You are way behind the time. You got to wake up, man. You got to wake up. Here's New York Post. Parents, stop teaching your kids to be weak. The basic question comes down to this. Do you want your children to be happy, that nebulous expression of doting, or do we want them to be resilient in the face of an anxiety-inducing world? They go on to say, why don't you raise your kids to be resilient and tough instead of happy? And you will find that they are happy. The result has been people who are una unable to handle daily life. Being able to survive in a society is a skill, and we're failing to teach our kids this. By protecting them at all costs from anything bad and not teaching coping skills for when things don't go their way, we're raising a society of weaklings who take to their bed at the first sign of conflict. But you know, that's a sign of the Jezebels around. When Ahab didn't get his way, he went to bed and pouted and sucked his thumb. You know what I mean? Waited for Jezebel to bail him out. That's what these kids are doing. Some mamas like that. Some mamas want to raise a bunch of Ahabs. You're raising an Ahab, man. A little spongy Ahab. You're not raising a man. Forbes magazine says, of course, helping kids build mental muscle isn't easy. It requires parents to be mentally strong as well. These parents don't condone a victim mentality. Getting cut from the soccer team or failing a class doesn't make your child a victim. Rejection, failure, and unfairness are a part of life. Rather than allowing kids to host pity parties or exaggerate their misfortune, mentally strong parents encourage their children to turn their struggles into strength. They don't make their child the center of the universe. They don't give their child power over them. They don't let their child avoid responsibility. You won't catch a mentally strong parent saying things like, I don't want to burden my kids with chores. Kids should just be kids. No, they say, what are you talking about? I'm here to teach them how to run a house. That's my job as a parent. Not just serve them for a few years and, and, and let the little sponge roll around out somewhere. No, it's sponge off everybody else. Don't shield a child from their pain, they say. It's tough to watch kids struggle with hurt feelings or, or anxiety, but kids need to practice firsthand. They say, I'm anxious. Things are going wrong. I've got problems. I know that's life. Deal with it. Deal with it. Deal with it. You're not being mean when you do that. You're teaching them life. You're there to support them and guide them where you need to. I'll close with National Review. A study shows that the grip strength of a sample of college young men has declined significantly between 1985 and 2016. The grip strength of college men has declined so much from 117 pounds of force to 98 that it's now matched that of older millennial women. So the college boys have the same strength as an older millennial woman and rapidly declining, rapidly declining. Basically, the average college male had no more hand strength than a 30-year-old mom. It takes children 90 seconds longer to run a mile than it did 30 years ago. National Review says, simply put, we're getting soft. And nobody's getting softer than college young men. They close by saying, whatever you do, ignore all the voices that tell you that you need to raise a bunch of sponges. You need to raise a bunch of soft boys. 
God help us. Dear Holy Father, we give you thanks for your goodness. Lord, I've tried to preach this the best I can. I've been preaching it for years, Lord. Maybe, God, somebody will listen right now. Maybe somebody will listen today and you'll change a life out there. You'll save a boy from being effeminate. You'll save a boy from being a sodomite. You'll save a boy from a life of dependence and sponging off others. You'll teach him to be a man. Maybe some mamas will get a hold of this today. Maybe some young men themselves, some young boys will get a hold of it today. Oh, God, help us bring back and, and oppose and get in the way of this wicked agenda, this wicked Aquarian conspiracy, this great falling away. Let us get in the way of the devil, Lord, and resist this wickedness. And we thank you for the blood of Jesus. We thank you for salvation and eternity. And we thank you for all you're doing. Lord, let us quit ourselves like men. Let us overcome and get through and endure hardness like a good soldier of Jesus Christ. Oh, Father, get a hold of some fathers. Get a hold of some fathers, Lord, that they get outside with their boys, that they get some work going. Oh, God, that they toughen up these sponges in the name of the Lord Jesus. Amen.